All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on Twitch. No engines, no libraries. We try to take a look at the entire pipeline here so we can learn about every last little detail that goes into game development. Uh, no nook and cranny unexplored, really. Sometimes we explore them to great detail, in fact. And you're like, no, don't go any further into that nook and or cranny, but there we go anyway. And that's just the nature of the show. Now, <clears throat> uh, yesterday we started something where we wanted to sort of do this dynamically uh, generated ground texturing uh, that we were working on, and I would like to get back to that. But before I do, I'll just point out that anyone who pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org who wants to follow along should have gotten a link in their email. Uh, and that link um, will have the source code in it. And you want to unpack day 84's source code? Uh, to match where I am today, because we're here on day 85. I know it's a little confusing because we missed a couple days last week due to the fact that I was away, so now the, the fives don't line up with weeks anymore. I don't know how, but we'll have to like skip a few days some other time to like get it back up to alignment. But for now, it's all crazy. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, so what we did is we made a um, <clears throat> we made a little repeating ground texture thing here, uh, which we could sort of generate. Well, it's not really repeating. Sorry, it's non-repeating ground texture uh, that can kind of just generate ground that goes for as long as you want. Um, and so what we did is we just generated one buffer's worth, and you can see it getting displayed uh, behind the sort of the the trees here that I'm moving around in. And what we need to do now, where we stopped yesterday, is we need to figure out a good way to make it so that as we scroll off to where there isn't any more of this buffer, we can start to, you know, we can generate what would have been uh, in the next part of the buffer, so that as we walk further through the world, we just are constantly getting a nice non-repeating ground texture built out of those splats that we, you know, that we were kind of using to make them. Um, so, you know, I thought about this a little bit uh, just, just right before the stream, I was thinking about it, uh, what we had been working on. Um, there is something that I thought of that's actually, I feel like, a slightly smarter way to do things uh, that, you know, we haven't actually done this part yet. But instead of doing it the way that I had suggested we were going to do it, I was thinking we could do it uh, in a slightly smarter way. Uh, just one of those things you don't necessarily think of uh, right off the bat because, you know, hey, it's, it's on stream and, and well. Sometimes it gets crazy in here. Uh, but the thing that I was thinking was, what I said before was, oh, we'll have like, you know, we'll have this back buffer and we'll draw the ground texture into it. And so like the screen is here, you know, um, and here's the buffer, right? Uh, and as you move around it, when you get to the edge, we'll like blit what's on the screen like backwards uh, to make room for new stuff. Uh, and we'll move the screen backwards as well. But then I realized that's actually kind of dumb. Uh, and the reason that that's kind of dumb is because we're already spending the bandwidth uh, to copy this buffer onto the screen anyway, right? It's already got to scroll around. And since that's happening, what I was thinking is, why don't we just make the buffer be a set of tiles anyway, right? So we just break it up into tiles, you know, like I don't know how big they are. Maybe they're, you know, 256 by 256 or something, right? Uh, just tiles. And then what we'll do is we blit the tiles, you know, on to the screen into the location they're supposed to go. And that way we never have to do any blitz here. All we do is reallocate tiles uh, to be locations on the screen, right? Um, that's it. Like, we don't have to do anything else. It, it just works. So there's no blitting. There's no management of it. It's literally just some array of tiles. And we can say how many we want. So let's say, you know, we've got a 256 by 256 tiles, right? And we want to have, you know, I don't know how many of them. Let's say we want to have 64 of them or something like this. Or I'm not sure how many we would actually need at our target resolution. You know, if we're 1920 by 1080, right? Um, then you can imagine, like, if we, if we let Emacs uh, quick calc, calc for us, um, if we want to say 1920 uh, divided by 256, right, that's 7.5 uh, in this direction. And uh, same thing for uh, 1080 divided by 256, that would be 4.2, right? 
Um, so we're talking like something like eight times five or 32 to cover the screen. And so if we wanted, you know, to cover the screen and then some, we'd be talking about, you know, uh, something substantially more than 32. So yeah, so maybe we do 64 or something like that, right? So what I was thinking is why don't we just make an array of these uh, and then we just have for each one of them where it is in world space. Then when we move the screen around, we just look to see uh, if any of them are, uh, you, you know, we basically like march through uh, all of the tiles that we think we want on the screen, uh, in, you know, and, and, the, and sort of the apron around the screen. And we say, make sure that these are in our set of 64. And whenever it needs to fill a new one that it doesn't have in that set, uh, it'll just evict whatever the least recently used one that we had was and replace it with a new one, right? And that seems a lot more sane to me because then there's no blitting ever, right? You're only doing the copy to the screen, which we had to do anyway. And that just seems like a much better idea. So I think this is what I'm going to implement instead of the thing I said I was going to implement. Uh, and since we haven't done any of it yet, we don't really, we didn't waste any time. So it just seems like a smarter thing to do. And so that's the thing that I am going to do. So really, uh, the only thing that needs to change here uh, is, let's, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this here. The only thing that needs to change here is, you know, this, we've got this sort of uh, ground buffer that's sitting here. And this ground buffer P, really all I'm talking about is let's just make an array of these, right? And uh, I think, you know, now is probably a good time uh, to introduce that transient arena because if anything, uh, if there was ever anything uh, that was properly transient, meaning something that can be recomputed from scratch and does not need to be saved in any way, it's these ground buffers, right? Because these ground buffers are completely generative uh, from information that we have. We're saying that, we're saying that's the rule for how they're even created. And so I think I wanna introduce that, um, that uh, sort of transient arena uh, at, at this point. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna call that the transient arena, right? And we're gonna go ahead and initialize that like we were initializing the world arena. And these guys are gonna come out of that, right? Uh, so we're going to have some some notion of these here. We're going to have a struct uh, ground buffer. Or, you know, we could make this fairly general too. I guess we, we don't really have to call it ground buffer. But I'll call it ground buffer for now. And we'll see if we ever use it for anything else. Um, ground buffer. Ground buffers. And then we'll also have a ground buffer count. Like so. And in here, the ground buffers will just be, again, positions. Uh, and bitmaps. That's it. Uh, and I don't think we necessarily need anything else for them. Uh, can't really think of anything else for them. At least not offhand. So yeah, so let's go ahead and expand that, uh, that notion of the world arena here. And again, if you'll remember, what we set up our game to have is we set up our game to have two sort of memory areas, right? One memory area was for permanent storage, I said. And what that is is something that needs to be preserved from frame to frame. Then the other area that I had allocated is one that we hadn't used yet. And what I wanted to do with that one is for stuff that we don't really care what happens to it. So if it does get preserved from frame to frame, maybe that's good, maybe that saves us work. Uh, but if it doesn't, then no big deal. And so for example, if we were going to reload a game uh, or, you know, sleep, uh, you know, a game like got shut down temporarily and wanted to like come back to life or something, the stuff in the transient uh, arena could literally just not be stored at all. It's something that we, if we, we could trade time, basically CPU time to regenerate it, right? It's not something that's got, that's got to be saved. Um, and so, you know, we haven't really seen much uh, that we would need to do with that yet. But this is kind of a good uh, first thing. So, you know, let's go ahead and, and actually start talking about, uh, about that. So we've got our transient storage size and uh, there's nothing in there. So I'm gonna make the transient arena um, <clears throat> basically use that whole transient storage size. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and do transient storage there. Uh, 
like so. So I'm going to initialize this other arena. And now we have a second place that stuff can come out of, essentially, right? Um, we don't really have any other stuff that we want to partition yet uh, in our in our world stuff. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably get to that a little later on. But for our transient arena now, we'll just have it be the whole thing. Uh, and we'll start by uh, by allocating some space out of that for these ground buffers. So when we come out here to the ground buffer, uh, I want to... Again, you'll notice we set ourselves up for success by having the make empty bitmap take which arena it was going to use. So now I can ask uh, for it to use that transient arena. And similarly, I can go ahead and make um, the whole array exist in there as well. So I don't know how many ground buffers we want to have. I suppose that might be something that's based on how much memory we actually have. So it might be that different profiles of the game have different uh, numbers of these ground buffers because obviously storing more ground buffers means we have to recompute them potentially less often. Uh, but let's just say for now we're going to store 128 of them. Uh, quick calc, let's see. If we want to do 128 256 by 256 textures at 4 bytes per pixel, uh, how big is that going to be? Let's see. Uh, that is a 32 megabyte backing store, right? Uh, which seems totally reasonable on modern machines. 32 megabytes of a backing store is not very many, uh, and that seems like a reasonable cache for our stuff. Um, so I don't feel like that's uh, asking too much. We could even go hog wild here and do 256. I don't know if that, I mean, that could just be crazy. Uh, so maybe, you know, cut it down a little. We'll see. Those are numbers that are easy to tune. No, no real, uh, nothing's really based on them. So it's fine. Anyway, uh, so if we go in here and say, all right, uh, we've got, we're going to make this, um, this empty bitmap. We need to first, uh, we need to make 128 of them. But first, what we need to do is actually make space for the array, right? So we need to make space for the ground buffer array, like so, ground buffers. Um, and that's going to be one of these. Uh, let's see, where do we have our push thing? I don't remember how we wrote it. Push array, there it is. So we're going to do push array out of the transient arena. Right? And we want to push a uh, like this many of this uh, struct here that we've defined the ground buffer struct, like so. Uh, and then we're going to loop through them and allocate empty buffers for them, right? Uh, and I guess for now, we won't even draw that ground chunk yet. That, that uh, We're going to deal with that uh, a little bit later on. So here we go. Uh, ground buffer index equals zero. Ground buffer index is less than that count. Uh, and then for each of those, <clears throat> for each of those, uh, we're going to grab out which ground buffer it is. So this is the ground buffer, game state ground buffers, like so. Uh, we are going to get the nth one of them, and then we're going to uh, allocate its bitmap, and we're going to uh, set its p, uh, presumably to null. Do we have a null world position? I don't know if we do or not. Uh, what exactly? I thought we did, because I thought we had some stuff that wanted uh, null world positions, um, but I could be wrong about that. Null position, that's what we wanted. So we, we basically want to say that, you know, these, these uh, ground chunks aren't initialized yet. They have nothing in their bitmaps. Their bitmaps are, are empty. Uh, so, you know, they're ready to be composited anyway. Uh, now, make empty bitmap is probably a little bit overzealous in this case too. Uh, because if we look here, it's it's calling zero size, and so what I might do is I might say you know clear to zero is a thing that you can do, uh, and it's going to do it by default. Um, but in this case, we don't actually care, so there's really no need uh, to do that. So what I'll probably do is say, all right, you know what, don't clear it because we are going to clear it later. There's you know we're, we got to clear these every time we update them, so just don't bother doing that. Uh, and also what I might what I might also say is let's go ahead and uh, oh hello why are you not marked internal mr. mr. function call there we go uh, so what I might do also is say that okay you know if you pass a loaded bitmap to this thing it'll clear it for you so that we can have that uh, be a little bit more straightforward right so this is just going to be a clear bitmap bitmap like so uh, and uh, and that's going to take that bitmap's memory, 
uh, and uh, and clear it. I guess we should double check to make sure that it actually has some memory first. Uh, but yeah, so the total bitmap size is that, uh, and that'll clear it. So, <clears throat> okay, so when we do this make empty bitmap, we want to be able to set a ground buffer width and height um, that has nothing to do with the stuff that we computed before. This turns out to really not be necessary if we're doing the tiled-based architecture, uh, which is kind of nice. It gets us out of this estimation process, so that's actually kind of great. Uh, we can just say, you know, we don't care about that at all. Uh, and so what we can do here is just say, all right, we want to composite at a certain level. Uh, and so whatever that level compositing is, that's what we're going to use. So we're going to do ground buffer width uh, and ground buffer height are going to be out here. Uh, they're going to be things that we spec out. And we're saying 256 by 256 for now. But again, that's something we could tune uh, later. All right. So there we go. And, and then we're going to... to uh, use those anytime that we are talking about these things, All right? So uh, that should be relatively correct for most of it. Oh, hi there, spelling error. That's no good, let's get that mouse out of the way. Uh, and that is not bitmap, that is result. Ground buffer, uh, okay, so here's where we're actually drawing them. So now we have to actually start thinking about this a little bit. <clears throat> Again, this is we've we've uh, the drawing is going to be really pretty basic. It's really the compositing that's going to be the interesting part. Uh, well, actually, it's probably not even the compositing that's going to be the interesting part. It's going to be the determining what to uh, recreate and when. Uh, but yeah, so let's go through here and say, all right, for each one of the ground buffers that we have, right? We're going to do the exact same loop here uh, that we were doing before. Uh, this is where we're all counting on John Blow to save us and actually finally make C have good stuff that allows you to loop through things without typing this every darn time. Um, <clears throat> and without having to go down the deep dark rabbit hole of C++. <clears throat> Guaranteed to let you almost loop through the things you want to loop through, but then frustrate you at the very last minute. Anyway, um, yeah, so all we're doing is we're, we're basically going through exactly these these same things here that we were going through. And then what we're going to do is, is draw the, it in exactly the same way, right? Uh, we're going to use that, that uh, ground buffer, that position, exactly how we were using it before. Uh, we have a, a little bit of a question here, and I don't think there's necessarily a right answer to this question one way or the other, uh, but that is what exactly is the, you know, how is this aligned? So I've got a bitmap, it's got a width and height, how is that aligned around the ground buffer's position in world, you know, in the world? Is it is P the center of that bitmap? Is P the upper left corner of that bitmap? Uh, you know, that's that's mostly what we're talking about here. I'm going to say um, that this is the center of the bitmap, uh, and the reason I say that is because it's not entirely out of the question uh, that we will just let these things splat out so that they won't actually be 256 by 256 clipped rectangles. They'll actually have some like overhang, if that makes sense. Um, this is kind of one of those things that it's hard to say uh, what the right answer is to one way or the other. So I'm, I'm not sure what we want to do with that. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to say it's the center. Uh, and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it if we need to change that. So assuming that it is the center, uh, then what we need to do here is first, again, we need to do, uh, let's, let's start with that subtraction. What we're doing here is saying, okay, tell us where uh, the ground buffer is, this particular ground buffer. Uh, tell us where that is relative to where the camera is, right? Because that tells us the offset from the center of the screen, uh, right? So from there, again, we, we now know that, uh, okay, this is the center of the screen, right? This is the screen center X. Um, and we then want to move, well, this is kind of like a little bit stuck in there. I could put this in here a little bit better, like so. There we go. <clears throat> uh, so what we want to do, right, is we want to take the center of the screen uh, in X and Y, right? We want to move by whatever that delta tells us to do. And again, unfortunately, uh, we have to, <clears throat> ah, right. 
And there's so many, uh, I guess we could do that right here. There we go. We want to first change it from meters to pixels because we're drawing in pixels here, right? And again, this is something that the render will do for us eventually once we actually have one. We then want to say from the screen center, we got to move uh, by whatever that delta is in pixels. And we have to move the negative in Y because remember Y in our world goes uh, up towards the top of the screen, but Y in our screen space goes down. Uh, kind of an annoying thing. Again, this is stuff that the render coordinate system will take care of us once we move this stuff into a real render. It's not really that big of a deal. It seems annoying at the moment, but it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, so I would, so don't, don't worry too much about it. Um, and then we've got our width and height, uh, which we're sort of offsetting to figure out where the, the ground buffer should be, right? Now, once we have that, we have to draw it, uh, and that's, uh, that's really it. But what we want to do is make sure that we're not drawing any ground buffers here uh, that aren't actually valid, right? So ones, oops, uh, ones that have not actually had any, you know, been filled with a particular world position value, we need those, uh, we need basically those to be uh, known to us, right? We need to make sure that uh, we, we know which ones those are. And so I believe we've got an is valid, we do. So I'm just gonna do that check uh, to see if the position of it is valid and that'll be our test uh, to see. And I'll put a little note in here just so we know. Uh, note uh, p is invalid, uh, I should say an in invalid p tells us that this uh, ground buffer has not been filled, right? Okay. So that'll draw all of our ground buffers at the locations that they're supposed to be uh, if they have actually been filled with valid data, right? Now, I want to take a, a, you know, another step here. I want, to, I want to go one step further and say that, well, what we want to know is we also want to know which of our ground buffers actually has been getting used, right? Because we want to be able to fill these ground buffers uh, with new information and we want to know if we needed to make a new ground buffer for some place that we're scrolling towards or something like this, uh, we want to be able to uh, fill it. We want to be able to know which old one we can throw away, if that makes sense. Um, and so if you think back here, what I said, I was sort of saying, okay, uh, well, I don't know where I was saying it. I don't see it for some reason. That's odd. I thought I drew this. I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind, people. I thought I drew a little, like, I thought I drew a little thing that looked like this. I guess I didn't. Well, anyway, if we have this, right, if we have 256 by 256 by 64, which actually now I think we said was 128, but that's whatever. So if we have this array, right, and we've got this array of chunks, and they're each, you know, they correspond to some location, like this one's here, uh, and this one's this one over here, and this one's that one over there, right? So now, if we have some way, we haven't figured out exactly how to do that yet, but if we have some way, uh, and again, this is said the P tells you, right, where it is. If we have some way of saying which ones we want filled, and we find out, oh, we want this one to be filled, right? We need that to, we need that to have data now. How do we know which one of these old ones to get rid of? Because some of them we're still using probably, and we don't really want to get rid of something we're still using. And so what I'd like to do is introduce the concept, uh, a very simple concept to start with, uh, which is the notion uh, of an LRU, right? Or least recently used. Uh, this stands for least recently used, L-R-U, L-R-U. Uh, I want to introduce the concept of a least recently used scheme. And a least recently used scheme is just something which allows you to say, whatever one of these things I least recently did something with, right? Like I least recently drew it on the screen. And so we can just assume that something that hasn't been drawn for a long time, we must not need very much anymore. And it's not the best indicator necessarily of what won't be necessary. We don't really know if that's a good idea. We could, for example, use 
uh, a different scheme, which is whatever one is furthest away from the player at that time, right? But you can imagine situations uh, where it actually is more robust to use something like least recently used or something else like that, where we have, say, a situation where the player can teleport between two places, right? And like they're going back and forth between this teleporter for some reason. Uh, then looking at how far away something is might not be the best way to say whether that thing needs to get filled, right? It might be better to just go, whatever we've been re using recently, we should just keep because it seems like it's, it's a good idea, right? Uh, so I don't really have a particularly uh, strong opinion about how we want to do this. So I'm just going to do a very simple way of, of authoring this first. And if we find out we need something better later, we can do something better later. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce a linked list right? I'm going to introduce a singly uh, linked list here. Um, or I guess, I don't know, well, might we need a doubly linked list to remove things? I don't know that we will. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Actually, I think now that I'm thinking about this, I'm taking it back. I think we may not really need that now that I think about it. You know what? We don't need that. We've already got an array, right? And we're going to be looping through this array. So we're going to be starting at the beginning and we're going to be looking through it to see which ones we need to render, right? If we encounter one that doesn't need to be rendered, Right at that time, we could just go ahead and do array compaction, moving this stuff, moving the, the subsequent things up into its position and shuffling it uh, down past the end of where there were things that actually did need to get rendered. We could do that. Because if you look at what's actually in this structure at the moment, it's mostly just a world position and a loaded bitmap, and the loaded bitmap actually doesn't really need to be there, if you think about it, right? Um, because a loaded bitmap, oops, I uh, gotta, where's my struct, where's my loaded bitmap struct? Where, where is it? There it is. A loaded bitmap, really all we need is this, right? Effectively, we don't need any of this other stuff, right? We just need just the memory pointer, because we already know that the width and height is constant across all these things. You know what I'm saying? So we've really just got that. So how big is a world position? Let's take a look. So a world position uh, is, is what? One, two, three, one, two, three. So it's six four byte things. It's 24 bytes uh, plus eight bytes. It's 32 bytes. So probably it would be just fine to just actually keep our array in sorted order to be completely honest with you. That may actually be the smartest thing to do. Hard to say, but that may actually be the smartest thing to do. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The linked list scheme, the way that would look, right, is it would introduce uh, more stuff in here. It would introduce like a, an, at least a next pointer, possibly a previous next pointer. Let's, let's, try, it. let's try it this way. Let's try it. I'm just, I'm just, let's, let's go for it. That's, I mean, you know, why not? Uh, so instead of doing it this way, I'm just going to say loaded bitmap, bitmap. Uh, and uh, you know what I could also do here? I can introduce an exemplar. So I could say basically like, <clears throat> you know what? There's a loaded bitmap that's like uh, ground bitmap, uh, like template, right? Uh, and basically what we'd say is, okay, the game state, you know, ground bitmap template, uh, we equals make empty bitmap. And then actually all we store out of that uh, right here is we just store, we just store the memory. That's it. We just store what this thing said the memory was. And then when we want to draw it, all we do is just use uh, that guy, that ground uh, bitmap template. We just use that and overwrite the memory pointer with whatever the memory pointer is that we want. Because we don't need to store the pitch and all that other stuff multiple times. Uh, there's no point uh, to that at all, right? That's just kind of a waste. So if you think about what we're doing here, we basically say, all right, okay, okay, okay. You know, 
uh, I take it back. We've got a loaded bitmap. Uh, and you know what, it's true, we weren't even using that stuff in here for the most part, so it's really just the draw bitmap call it and use it. But anyway, um, this is the actual bitmap that we're gonna draw. We grab out of the ground buffer, we grab out its memory. Um, so, wait, sorry, game state, uh, ground bitmap template, like so. Uh, and we just grab out its memory and stick it uh, in the bitmap uh, that we're going to use, and then we use that bitmap, right? That's, that's really it. Uh, so that seems relatively, relatively clean. And this can really be the bitmap width, like so. Uh, and in fact, that basically means we don't have to store these either, right? Uh, because they're implicit in that bitmap. Uh, yeah, I think that's basically all we really need. So that also means, I suppose, uh, that this can just be uint32s there. Uh, and those can be used directly, and then they will be saved automatically. So that seems relatively clean. I like that. That 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 seems like the right thing to do. Um, this is a dot, and off we go. Bitmap memory ground buffer. That's a dot as well. Oops. Dot. Uh, whoa. I'm sorry. I didn't even realize the game was still running. That's my bad. Yeah, we're totally mucking with the memory layout here, so it would not be a good time uh, to have the automatic DLL loading be, being loading in and thinking it was interpreting the old data in the new way. Uh, all right, so that seems to me pretty sane. And so now all we have to do is actually think through, uh, well, you know what we could do first? Before we try to do the LRU scheme, we could just do something that actually makes these bitmaps get composited because we got plenty of work to do there uh, as it is. So yeah, first let's verify that nothing draws when we run it. Uh, yeah, so I've got something buggy in there um, because it shouldn't be drawing any of these because it shouldn't get is valid on any of them, right? So I just want to make sure uh, that that wasn't happening. And of course it is happening. So let's just debug that quickly. And there's one other thing that we can do uh, to do debugging first that's, uh, what, what is the problem here? Uh, What is the problem here? Ground buffer count, uh, ground buffer p, ground buffer index. So what is my, let's take a look here. What is my situation with ground buffers? There's the ground buffers. Oh, come on, there we go. Ground buffers, let's just take a look at them here. There they all are. Just using that comma 128 notation to see where everything is. So why are these, what did I mess up here? Why are these set to like real things? Something is busted. Uh, I hope I didn't do something weird with my transient arena. Because we weren't supposed to be using anything in the transient arena yet. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but then again, we haven't ever tested it. So there is that. So these are all set properly, right? You can see them set, being set properly. Uh, so let's go through here and see what's going on uh, when I come through here. So, ah, ha <laughs> I guess not. There we go. So it turns out I was using that transient arena uh, in my sim arena right here. All right, so way to not put a to-do on that, Casey. That was just sloppy programming right there. Now, it didn't actually cause us any problems because I found it right away, but I still think that's an owl of shame because there should have been a to-do there that said something like, once we talk about the transient arena, make this actually do something real, right? Uh, and we didn't do that at all. So yeah. Okay, so now we get into more of the memory partition stuff, actually, uh, which is to say that what we, we actually have the need to have an actual memory partition on our transient arena, right? Um, and the way that this works is there's two ways that you can do this, right? Um, and I don't know which way we want to do in the end. It depends on how you want to think about your memory, right? Um, so... One way to do it is to say that we always have a fixed amount of memory, right? 
the memory amount's fixed. Uh, it's however much it is, it's two gigabytes or something, that's what our game runs in or who knows, right? And then you just pick how you're going to divide it up and, you know, off you go. I guess I should really, I guess I should really say three ways. Uh, this is, this is like completely fixed. This is 100% fixed layout, right? And the advantage of this scheme uh, where I'm basically saying, okay, you know, some stuff lives in here, then we've got another thing in here for the renderer, let's say, and then we've got another thing in here, right? And, and this is some other stuff, whatever, right? The benefit of this is it always works 100% predictably, right? You know exactly what's going on and there's no mystery to it. Uh, the downside of it is these things aren't flexible, right? So it means that, you know, if you wanted to have, if there was a game that could take advantage of having the renderer, like, take more memory sometimes uh, than, like, you know, the physics or something in certain scenarios where that was more appropriate, it could do it, right? Uh, you know, that's, like, the downside is that doesn't happen. Uh, then there's, like, you know, pseudo-fixed, uh, which is to say that you you have some amount that you're going to live in, right? Uh, so that's still the same, but you don't necessarily say where stuff is. So during your frame processing, right, you like pile some stuff on and you see where that ends and then you pile some more stuff on and you see where that ends and you pile some more stuff on, right? And the problem with this scheme is if you don't know what these bounds are, you might just run over your two gig limit, right? So it can be a little unpredictable in that sense. And what do you do when you hit that, right? So you kind of have to know that you've set things reasonably in order for that to work at all. Uh, and finally, you can have one that's just kind of like free for all, right? Uh, and that's where you still use, you can still use the arena stuff like I'm using. Uh, you don't actually have to change that, but what actually happens is uh, you start off with allocating some memory and you start partitioning it. And then when you run out, you just go back to the system and ask for more, right? And you just chain these blocks together uh, as you go so that at the very end you can free them all certainly uh, and you know how many you have and you can clear them and do all this stuff with it but there's no finite bound on it so it's like i don't know if you want to try to allocate 18 gigabytes it'll just keep on going and allocating and allocating and allocating right uh, and so i don't know which of these we'll end up with in the end um, it really largely depends on sort of, I guess, how hard of a set of constraints we can impose on the code. Uh, so like, you know, this is usually the best way in terms of robustness because you can 100% guarantee that everyone operates out of, you know, every system. Uh, but it might not be the, it's not necessarily the best for things like modding and flexibility, right? Where you want people to be able to push those limits. Uh, now you can always make this be parametric, right? So you can make it so that you can always say, oh yeah, give it 16 gigs instead. And now each of these things is 8x bigger than it was. So you can still get some flexibility out of it that way, but you know, you can understand why a certain design of the game would have a different partition potentially than some other design. And so that's why sometimes people like to go with these other schemes. Um, well, to be fair, a lot of people just go with the like, you know, the WTF scheme, which is just like we call malloc everywhere. Woohoo! You know, and they have no idea what's going on. Um, that's not fabulous. Uh, so we're not even going to consider that one. We're just going to kind of scroll it off the screen here. We're going to pretend that that doesn't exist. All right. Um, but yeah. Again, there's trade-offs, different ways of thinking about things. It's all fine. Uh, but anyway, point being, so we have this transient arena. And what the transient arena is for is for stuff that is non-essential, right? Uh, so we have multiple things that want to access it. So what we want to do is introduce some sort of a system, something that we can use that makes it easy for us uh, to use that memory effectively, right? So I've introduced this transient arena here, uh, and that's the thing that subdivides that arena. What we really probably wanted to do here was also have the permanent arena, and we, we'd allocate the world arena out of that. Uh, I'll kind of explain why that's necessary when we get to some part where we actually have multiple things going on with the world arena, but for now we can ignore that um, and just say, okay, so we've got stuff that wants to happen in, uh, you know, in the transient arena. And then we also want, after that stuff is allocated, to have another set of things could be allocated, right? 
So what we want to do here is we want to make, you know, essentially a notion of where the boundary is between the stuff that actually has to, uh, a boundary between where the transient arena itself, uh, I'm not sure how to say this right. We want to make a boundary between the things that persist from frame to frame in the transient arena because they still carry over. Like our ground buffers don't get erased frame to frame. They just could get erased frame to frame. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm not sure if that makes, makes sense to you, but I'll, I'll try to show you what I mean. So let's suppose, for example, uh, we had a thing that was like transient arena, right? I'm sorry, uh, transient state like this, right? And we move the ground buffer in here like that. Does that make some sense? Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to say, okay, we've got an arena, you know, we've got that transient arena, and I would like that to actually live in here, right? And this is totally separate from our game state. It can be completely regenerated as necessary, right? Uh, and what this is going to do uh, is this is going to tell us, uh, this is going to keep track of what stuff we actually have already put in sort of the bottom part uh, of this of this transient arena. So like we've got you know a stack of stuff that we're growing, and we're saying that our loaded bitmaps to the ground buffers, like this, is going to be ground buffers, right? And they just live there. We know how big they are; they are always that size. So what we want to do now is say anything else. So sim regions, for example, the sim region memory wants to be in here. Right? That's where the sim region stuff wants to live. We want to make it easy for the sim region stuff to start after the total amount used for the ground buffers. Now, similarly, we may want to be able to partition it into other stuff up here, or what we may want to do is essentially bungee cord the sim region stuff. So that the way that the sim regions work is they grow down, right? But then when they're done, they pop back up to here, and whatever memory they used is gone, right? And that's probably what we want to do with them for right now. Uh, so let's start out with that, and we'll get a little more complicated as we go, but we'll start out with that. All right, so first things first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what we want to do here is we want to have initialization uh, for the transient state. So this is the transient initialization, right? And it works exactly the same way as, oops, initial, initialization. There we go. It works exactly the same way as this does, right? It's, it's literally exactly the same. This stuff is identical, right? Um, so what we want to do is take this. Uh, we want to move this down here, right? And uh, what we'd like to do is say, OK, uh, ass assume at least we, we want to make sure that there's no possible way that we couldn't fit at least the size of our transient uh, state inside the transient uh, storage size, right? And then we're going to assume that that first thing at the base of that transient storage, we're going to assume that that uh, is our transient state, right? So that's what's going to happen there. <clears throat> like so. Okay. Uh, so assuming that, uh, you know, we don't really have a, um, we don't really have a way of, of knowing which ones of these got cleared. Uh, and I think our, our definition was that stuff always had to initialize to zero. So I think the easiest thing probably to do would just be to have an initialized actually be in here. Um, that seems like the best policy. So I'm going to go ahead and say that that's what our policy is for right now. Uh, all right. So if we, if we see that our transient state is not initialized, then we're going to initialize it, right? Uh, that's what we're going to do exactly the same way uh, that we did it before. And we're going to initialize uh, this arena exactly the same way as we initialized the other one, like so, right? So this guy is going to come down here, like this. Again, I wasn't really planning on doing this today, but it seems like a fine time to do it. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do it. So transient storage size. Again, we will take away however much we use just to store that one state structure. Uh, and we will go ahead and uh, and there's a you know there's a clever way we could have done this um, as well, which is to initialize the arena first and then allocate the thing out of it. But yeah, six and one half dozen of the other. Anyway, 
So <clears throat> uh, this will start us out with that arena. And now we can allocate all of these things out of the arena um, directly, right? Just like we were doing before. Uh, and and uh, we, could, we could call this trans state so we don't have to keep typing transient, I suppose. Uh, so maybe we call it like this, like that. Trans state. Oops, trans state. Uh, yeah, something like that. And uh, maybe we call this tran arena as well. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> so if we take a look at what happens here, it's all exactly the same as what was happening on the other one, but now it's just happening in sort of the separate, uh, the separate area, right? And that's the only difference between what we were doing before and what we're doing now. Uh, it goes ahead and gets all this stuff out. So game state is gonna be trans state as far as this thing's concerned, like so. Uh, that's all good. Uh, and let's see if I can compile that there. What is my, oh, I have that. change that to transient. Let's see what else. Uh, trans state is initialized. There we go. And transient arena is now tran arena, like so. And one more time. Two more times. There we go. Uh, so that's gonna all be in there. And the interesting thing about this is you'll notice that now the transient arena is left at exactly the location uh, that we would want it to be for the sim arena to use it, right? So what we want to do here is just say, oh, okay, when this thing is using the sim arena, what we would like to do uh, is we would like it to just be able to use uh, whatever was in uh, the transient, whatever that transient arena was, right? And so what we can do there is we could just probably pass the transient arena for now. Maybe we want to actually make a sim arena in the future, but for now we could just pass the transient arena directly, right? And now it's going to use that sim arena uh, and that'll be fine. And the only thing that we have to fix now is when the simulation is done, we want to basically bungee back to uh, that location. So it's, you know, the sim region is going to use that arena. It's going to fill it up with stuff. And when it gets to the end, we just want it to kind of go back to the baseline that it was, you know, was that was just after the ground buffer stuff that we had allocated, right? Uh, and so to do that, I'm just going to introduce one more thing, which is like uh, sort of begin, you know, temporary memory or something. I don't know exactly what we're going to call it, but we're going to call it that for now. We're going to call that begin temporary memory. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to do the same thing, uh, end temporary memory, right? And the temporary memory, we're going to have, um, I don't know if we want the arenas to actually do pushes and pops. I'm considering. I think we do. I think we do. Uh, so we're going to do it that way, like so. Um, and then at the end, we're going to do a little uh, insurance policy as well. Uh, we're going to do something uh, like this, check arena, and we're going to do that for our game state, world arena, and our games, our trans state, tran arena, like so. So now we just got to implement these guys. Uh, we've got those pushes, uh, we got these pushes and, and stuff on here, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize these. Uh, they're really, really simple. All they're designed to do is to spring forward and back uh, in memory space, right? Uh, so if we take a look at what these do, uh, let's see here, there we go. Uh, there, is, there is one extra level of security we could do here. I don't know if we actually want to. I'll think about it in a second after we're done with this. Uh, but basically all we're doing here is saying, okay, uh, you can begin and end temporary memory like so. When you actually do that, uh, the arena itself, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna put in the extra layer of security, uh, why not? Uh, so we'll, we'll have a little temporary memory thing here, temporary memory. And that's all it's gonna do, right, is, is store that used thing. It's just gonna store where the used field was because that's all we need in order to restore the state, right? Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and say, <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to say that we have temporary memory, uh, and this is the uh, like sim memory, 
And then when we end that temporary memory, I don't know why I put it here. It's supposed to be down after you're done, but what are you gonna do? Uh, then I'm gonna say, all right, we're done with it here, right? And uh, I'll, I'll also put the memory arena in there so that you don't have to save both of them, like so. Uh, and so then the temporary memory thing will, will return that. It'll say, okay, got a temporary memory uh, result. The result arena is whatever arena got passed in. Uh, the result dot used is going to be whatever that arena's used state was at the time when it was called. Yeah. Uh, and then the additional security I was going to put into was just the fact that there's going to be something like a temp count on the arena, uh, which will get initialized to zero. And every time we begin temporary memory, I'm just going to increment it. And every time we end, I am going to subtract it. Does that make sense? This doesn't take that anymore. Temporary memory temp mem. Uh, right. And so <clears throat> if you look at what this does, that just sort of lets me know how many times uh, this thing has been locked, right? Uh, and we might even make this an int so we can see if it went negative, it'll be easier for us to read, basically. Uh, so anyway, so if we take that arena, we set the arena used equal to whatever the temp mem uh, used was, right? Uh, and we might also do an assertion here and just say, let's assert uh, that we are always going, uh, you know, we're, we're always retracting memory. We're never jumping forwards because that would indicate probably a bug in whoever was calling us. Uh, and let's also um, assert here, for example, that the temp count is greater than zero because otherwise we should not be decrementing it. Uh, that would be bad, right? And, um, and yeah, and then we can finally add just one thing in here, which is, oops, which is check arena. Uh, and that's just, again, another assertion. And that assertion uh, allows us to verify that we ended every frame with a balanced number of temporary memory begins and ends, just so we make sure nothing funky happened, right? Uh, so this is just an assertion that arena uh, temp count is exactly zero always at the end. Uh, all right, so, oops, that's no good. Although I guess, why did I do that? That was dumb, could just do that. All right, uh, that's not right. That's, that is more correct. There we go. Don't know why I was really wanting to access result there. Uh, so let's see. So these are now all off of trans state, right? Um, so we want to go ahead and fix that. So here's, uh, here's our trans state, trans state. Uh, same here, trans state, and uh, that looks about right to me. And these need to take addresses, but other than that, they look good. And so we probably want to step into that. We just slammed a bunch of code in there. Uh, so we probably want to see what's going on. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So if we step through here, let's see what happens. So when we do our, uh, our sim memory here and, uh, and our tran, oops, let's try that again, sim memory and our tran state tran arena. Uh, so you can see there is exactly what we computed in Emacs in quick calc. There's our 32 megabyte backing store for ground tiles. Here's the total size. It's that giant, I don't know if it's one gigabyte. I don't remember how big it was. It's big, right? It looks like a gigabyte. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and, and create a temporary memory region, right? Uh, so I don't know where the, there we go. So if we go ahead and create that temporary memory region, you see we're just snapping what the use thing is. We increment that counter. Uh, and now we can kind of go through the sim region. We can do our stuff. The sim region is now busy. Uh, doing its, its allocating uh, its, its things. So if I jump down here, we should see it. Uh, this should have moved up, presumably, although it didn't, which is odd. Oh, no, it did. You can see it did. Uh, so it used a bunch of memory. And now what we'd like to do is when we, uh, when we hit that end memory, we should see that bounce back to what the previous use count was, which it did, and the temp count goes down to zero. Our check arena should both succeed because there's no open uh, memories there. And uh, yeah, and off we go. 
So now we've got that uh, straightened away, so our arenas are working properly now, uh, and that's good. What I would like to do now is, again, get these guys actually drawing, and what we could do is when we make them, right, we could actually do something here where we initialize some of them to be drawn. Uh, and so an example of that would be if I just drew one that was at uh, the camera's location, right? Uh, so if I told it, for example, our draw ground, uh, our draw ground chunk is now going to be like uh, some kind of a, uh, it'll, it'll probably be called like fill ground chunk or something like this, right? And we pass in uh, the same stuff. We're going to fill the ground uh, a ground chunk. It needs to know which ground chunk we want to fill. Uh, we'll just use the first one. I'll, I'll do a to do here. Uh, this is just a test fill. Um, so what I want to do here is say, okay, uh, this is this is game state presumably. I want to say, all right, let's fill that first one. Let's just fill that first ground buffer, right? Um, you know, uh, ground buffer plus zero basically. We'll fill that first ground buffer, and what we'll do is we'll say that we want it to be at where the camera uh, state actually is right now, like that, uh, and that should work roughly correctly, uh, ground buffers, probably, huh? Yeah. Uh, and then fill ground chunk needs that to be an address. Uh, connect for it hours two to loaded bitmap star. Ah, yes. Well, actually, that's something we could totally uh, work around with fill ground chunk, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I'm only saving the memory out of them, you have to do this nonsense every time, uh, which isn't ideal, uh, admittedly, right? Uh, but I could do this like so, transient state, you know, like that, uh, and then it's just uh, ground buffer, like that, buffer, uh, that would actually be uh, all that was necessary to recompute it. And so then we have something where we're gonna say, okay, loaded bitmap, um, Buffer equals trans state ground buffer template. Isn't there a ground buffer template? Where did my ground buffer, oh, ground bitmap template, sorry. Ground bitmap template, uh, but the memory equals the memory <clears throat> from that ground buffer. Uh, and then the other thing we want to do is we want to take the ground buffer and we want to set its p equal to the chunk p, right? Uh, and that should be good. So uh, buffer arrow equals buffer dot. Looks like we got them. Uh, that needs to be an address, and so does that. But off we go. So now maybe if we're lucky, we'll see one. And we did. Now, obviously, a, a buffer of that size doesn't need to be covered with such prodigious foliage. Uh, so, you know. We'll go ahead and cut that down a little bit. Uh, that may have been excessive. I admit that. Um, so, you know. All right, so that feels, fills one of the chunks, and now we are in a position to fill multiple chunks. So I would say if we hadn't have had to take the arena diversion, we probably actually would have had this working completely today, which would have been pretty cool. But I'm going to wait till tomorrow. We're almost at the q and I'm going to wait till tomorrow to actually do the filling scheme because uh, we have to talk about that LRU stuff a little bit more. But we're almost there. And then once that's done, that'll be it. That'll just, we'll be able to walk around and have an infinitely non-repeating ground texture that we can fill with anything we want, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm pretty happy about that, actually. Uh, so that should be kind of nice. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's stop for now. I don't want to get into something when I'm going to have to stop because it's going to be exciting to have that non-repeating texture and I want to be able to go straight to it. I don't want to have to uh, kind of go through a bunch of... Uh, of like, oh, you know, just let me eat a few more minutes of the Q&A kind of a thing. Uh, so let's just go to the Q&A now and do it that way. So we'll see. We shall see. Garlando Bloom, what is the most expired food you have ever eaten? That is not a question. 
that is related to the programming, Garlando. That is for the pre-stream. Game Davy, could you explain what pop and push are and how they work? I don't get it. Um, we didn't really use that nomenclature anywhere. Did I just, I probably just said that, or are you talking about these? Um, Game Dev E, could you be more specific? Do you just mean what I'm talking about when I say, when, when we use the temporary stuff or whatever? Uh, tell me, tell me what you mean by pop and push, just, just, in, just so I don't answer like the wrong question, basically. I will, I will wait patiently for the elaboration. <laughs> or not. Okay, pop and push for memory storage. Yes, I can talk about that. Alrighty. Uh, so at the start of the game, so remember, and again, this I realize I don't say this enough because I come from a time when this was just a given that everyone thought this way, but I realize that nowadays it's, it's possible to be a programmer who's actually worked for many years and not even think about things at all this way. So I'm just gonna be very explicit here because I realize not everyone comes at it from a similar perspective. So first let's just say something. Memory uh, is a big line, right? Uh, so memory is something in which I'm going to store data and there's addresses to it, right? And so I can talk about my computer's memory, how many, however big it is, I don't know how much it is, I think this, this, might have, this, this machine might have 12 gigs, 12 gigs of memory, right? Physical memory, you know, is starting at, at, at byte zero and going to byte 12 gigabyte, right? Uh, but I'm actually in virtual memory, right? Because all operating systems use virtual memory. So technically, you know, this 12 gigabytes of memory, uh, I don't actually look at directly. I don't actually see that uh, directly in terms of addressing, right? What I see is virtual memory, right? So I see a virtual address space imposed by the CPU um, where it basically says, okay, I'll tell you what, Casey, you've got this virtual address space and when you want to allocate memory, right, when you want to use some memory, I'm going to tell you that some part of your virtual address space, starting at byte something, let's say, you know, byte X, and going for however big you asked for. So if you ask for one gigabyte of memory, it's going to go to X uh, and, and X plus one gigabyte, right? These are the byte values, literally like a number, some number that tells me where we are in this thing. And that's mapped to some set of pages in physical memory, and I don't even know how it is, right? So I never even see the physical memory. We're always dealing with virtual addresses, right? Um, so it's interesting to talk about this sometimes when we get down to it, but as far as we're concerned right now, we're working totally in a virtual address space, right? That's ma managed by Windows and the CPU, and we don't even know exactly what it's doing a lot of times. So when I get memory, at the beginning of, this, uh, of the game, if you remember, we, way back in one of the early episodes, we just allocated, I think it was one gigabyte of memory for what we called transient storage, right? And so what that does is it takes a virtual big one gigabyte line and reserves it for our use and it tells us a number, which is the base of that line. It tells us where it starts, right? So if you imagine that, <clears throat> Uh, I'll, I'll continue drawing it this way. So this is the start of our transient memory. So for all intents and purposes, you know, we have a base pointer. You can see it in here, um, uh, handmadeplatform.h. Memory. Right here. So uh, you can see that we basically, we get past this at startup. This is what the platform layer allocates for us. It's got a void star transient storage. That's a pointer. It's the number that's in our virtual address space where the start of that transient storage is. And it's this big, however transient storage type says, right? So this right here 
is transient storage pointer, right? It points to right there. And this size is transient storage size, right? So now, when typically other stuff would call like, you know, new, right, in C++, or malloc in C, or whatever in your language, whatever it is that allocates something, whatever you're used to thinking in. What that does is it essentially actually does a similar thing here. It's got a big flat line, right? And it goes and it finds a region where it can stick the thing that you wanted and it sticks it in there. But we're not using any of these because honestly, I think they're all kind of a waste of time. What we're doing instead is we're just saying, let's just manage this directly because it's not that hard to do. And if we just manage it ourselves, we get a lot of benefits and we, we, don't, uh, we get a lot faster and a lot simpler in a lot, of, in a lot of places, in my opinion. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with these. I just don't like them. Um, my preference is, is no. So what we do instead is we say, all right, what happens when we need to do a new? What happens when we need to make some storage? Uh, well, what we do is we just say, okay, whenever we need to make storage, we just stick it uh, at wherever the next free space is on this, in this line. We, we start at the very first byte, byte, you know, whatever the start of the transient memory is, and we just put it in there. And then we make whatever is immediately after it, the byte immediately after it, be the new space where we would put things if a new thing comes in. So if a new thing comes in, we do the same thing, right? And I call this pushing because it always just adds on to the end, right? It's like pushing it on to the thing. It pushes it on, pushes it on, pushes it on, right? It makes more sense if you think of it growing from the bottom up. I just didn't draw it that way, but you're like pushing something on top, right? Putting things on the bottom is a little weird, but I tend to draw them from the top down because uh, I like to think of like l this as being increasingly positive going down. That's just how like humans are hardwired because we read top to bottom. So when I say pop, what I mean is, well, if we pushed a bunch of things on, but now we don't need them anymore, we could just pop them off by taking whatever the number is uh, that we started at. So let's say we started here. This is some number x, and we go down to get to some number y. If we want to erase all these things effectively that we allocated, if we basically want to do a free operation, we can just take whatever our thing that was saying where the next thing to allocate was and reset it to x. You can just jump back down. And now those things are effectively gone because whatever the next thing that gets allocated will overwrite some of them, right? We'll just overwrite them. Uh, so push is alloc and pop is free, right? Now the restriction here is you have to do these in order, right? You can't free something out of the middle of this stack. And so the thing that gets, the thing that, that uh, is I think the reason people uh, lean on these so heavily is these are out of order allocations and free things. Uh, and we have to implement that ourselves. We already did it with a free list in one place. Uh, and that's what I prefer to use. I tend to prefer to use free lists so that once things get allocated, they never really go away unless they're purely temporary. Uh, and I find that's way more efficient and I never run into all those problems that people have where they're like, oh my God, we got memory fragmentation and we're allocating so much per frame and all these allocs and oh my God and whatever is going on. And plus it allows us to do a lot of easier stuff um, in terms of visualizing our memory space, but that's a thing for a later date. So that's what I mean in terms of push and pop. But if you didn't want to do any of this, if you're like, I don't know, Casey, I don't like this, it, it, it feels freaky, you could just imagine doing new and free everywhere, um, right? Uh, but you can already kind of see why there's some nice things about doing it this way. Like, just think of all the complexity we didn't have to have um, because we were doing it this way, right? All I had to do um, <clears throat> to just make that whole sim region go away, right? was just this one call, begin temporary, and then at the end we just said end temporary, right? That would have, if we were doing that with the crazy, you know, garbage collected pointer nonsense, all of this work would have had to go on behind the scenes to go, okay, what's in a sim region? Okay, these things are in a sim region. Make sure, okay, destroy all of those. What are they pointing to? Destroy the things that they're pointing to. Okay, wait, uh, are these pointers, is that thing still reachable? All that stuff is just gone. We never pay it at all, right? The most optimal code is the code that never gets run. I think Mike Abras said something like that, right? And we are right in that 
sweet spot here. We don't have to do any work to clean up what we do. All we do is we set one number. It's like the old number equal, the new number equals the old number or whatever, or like our, our, our stack top equals the old stack top. That's it, right? And that's just so powerful and so efficient compared to if we had been doing these things, we would have had to either implement a bunch of stuff ourselves to do it or lean on a garbage collection system, some pre-written garbage system to do it for us if we didn't want to just be in nightmare territory all the time here, right? Uh, and so that's why I highly recommend exploring doing your own memory management because you may find that for a lot of the stuff you do, it's incredibly efficient and really pretty simple. Like there's just not that much to it. How will the ground texture chunking handle adjacent rooms with different types of ground? Uh, well, that's more of a world generation question. So basically like the ch world, ch the, the tile chunks, I'm sorry, the ground chunks or ground buffers, I guess we're calling them, uh, are just saying, get me whatever had to be in this region. But whatever we do to fill that can be as complicated as we want. So it can do like some ground and then overwrite it with some floor and even like feather the edges between them or whatever. That fill operation can be incredibly complicated, right? And it'll get complicated even without what you're saying, even without um, just uh, uh, overlapping. Because yeah, you're saying, you're saying basically like I have a chunk and like here's a room uh, boundary, you know, and this is like some kind of a tile floor here uh, but this is like, you know, grass or whatever, right? Uh, and the answer is like, that's the compositor's problem. So we'll work on that when we deal with compositing. We don't care about that uh, for the rendering stuff that we're doing here where we're just trying to figure out how we fill it and how we place it in, in places. But yeah, that's just stuff we'll do. We'll like, you know, it'll do the ground splats and then it'll like draw some tiles in there and off we go. Similarly, it'll have to handle stuff like, oh, there's a river running through this, this thing and like here's the edge of the river or whatever, right? and the ground is here, but like water is here or whatever, running running along it or something, right? So there's plenty of stuff that we have to deal with there, but that's really, that's really more about the procedural texture generation aspects and not about the chunking scheme because the chunking scheme is whatever the chunking scheme is. Is that it for cues? Is that it for cues? I think that's it for cues. We're done early today, aren't we? Well, all right. No more cues. I guess we're good to go. I will wrap things up. <clears throat> all right, let me close this down. Save our mischief. I like, I like saying save our mischief. Close this. Uh, all right. <clears throat> well, that was an easy one. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. Uh, it's been a pleasure coding with you as always. I'm kind of excited for tomorrow because then we'll have our ground tile working, I think, because we've basically done everything we need to. Uh, so really we just have to do some kind of an LRU scheme there and we'll be good to go. So that's going to be kind of fun to have a nice ground texture. And then we can start looking again at, at how to, you know, how to kind of do some, uh, some multi-level stuff there just to try to finish up our ground um, like handling our, our whole sort of ground state because we really haven't done the collision detection stuff that we need to do to finish that up. So I still got there, but we're we're in the home stretch on this sort of uh, on this sort of stuff, and then we're in you know like I said we're we're in kind of uh, we're in kind of a fun time I think. Uh, we got a bunch of code to do that will um, uh, that will probably go by fairly quickly like the debug code and that sort of stuff, and so it'll be kind of interesting. I don't know. It's all good. Um, yep, it's all good, and. Uh, and yeah, I guess I have nothing else to add other than I'm excited for tomorrow because I want to see that work. And uh, we've done pretty much everything we need to do to make it work. We just didn't quite have time today to actually go in and, uh, and have, some, you know, have some intelligent scheme about what gets filled when. So we'll do that tomorrow and it'll be good. Um, and that will happen again at 5 p.m. 
uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific Daylight Time. So same time and same place as today. I hope to see you all there. Uh, if you would like to follow along at home with the source code, you can do that by pre-ordering the game on handmadehero.org. If you pre-order the game, uh, it comes with the source code, you'll get a link in your email, which you can download anytime you want. And in fact, if you lose it, there's now a little have it resent button down here uh, in case you lose your download link. So that's a good thing too. Uh, so please check that out if you're interested. Also, we have a Patreon. If you want to support the video series, you can always subscribe to that. It is greatly appreciated. We have a news and forum site where you can ask questions and you can get ports of the game to Linux and Mac that community have done. Uh, there's also an episode guide that's annotated, which is really great for catching up on old episodes. And do not forget to check out the most awesome artificial intelligence ever created by humankind, ladies and gentlemen, the Handmade Hero tweet, uh, Schedule tweet bot which tweets the schedule at you, um, we believe it may slowly be coming sentient. We don't know this for sure, uh, but we think that it, it may have been because it is so powerful and now even understands time zones. So that's something to be pretty excited about. So if you want to subscribe to that, it'll tell you when the show is, uh, and that's pretty handy. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope to see you here tomorrow again at uh, 5 p.m. PDT or PSD, I guess. Uh, and until then, uh, have a wonderful day.